brought a Bible, I hope you did, Did you take and turn with me to the book of Acts. Surprising, I know. Some of you, that you, you can tell the faithful attenders, because their Bible would just fall right open to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, and we'll be looking at verses 6 through 20 this, this, uh, this morning, not 20, excuse me. 6 through 15 uh, this morning. Acts 16, verse 6 and following. All right, and as you're turning there, I want to voice a word of prayer, and then we'll stand and we'll read God's word. What does a group of sinners have to offer? A God that is not just holy. Not just holy, holy, but who is holy, holy, holy. You are majestic, Lord, and your kingdom, it is without end. And you reign supreme over all of life and death and eternity. And today what we want to bring is the emptiness of our lives. And everything that we have, and we want to lay it at your feet. And God, we want to acknowledge your right. Not in, invite you to do something. <laughs> you just invade. Lord, I, I pray that you would exercise your right today to take our plans, whatever those look like, to throw them out the window, and to alter our lives radically, God. We confess that too often we make this whole thing about what we want, what we think, what we desire. I pray today that we would see your heart for this church, that we would see your heart for the individuals in this room or watching online, for me, God, and that we would see your perfect plan unfold more fully today in the strong name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand with me, if you're willing and able, out of uh, reverence for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read this text in Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> starting in verse 6. It says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God, had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, verse 13, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention or to respond to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, And her household as well. She urged us saying. If you have judged me to be faithful. To the Lord. Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. You may be seated. In 2016. An article uh, popped up on the. On the Gospel Coalition website. There's an article, really kind of a a personal story or testimony by a pastor named Steve Besner. Steve uh, Besner 
had, in this article, he told the story about uh, a time in the, mid, uh, the mid-90s. Anybody remember the mid-90s? I barely do. All right. <clears throat> so, he told a story about a time in the mid-90s when he was attending Hardin-Simmons uh, University in Abilene, Texas, a small Christian college, Christian university down there. And, and Steve Besner, he was, he was studying theology. He, he went on, of course, to become a pastor. And, and uh, he told this story about how he was just, he was what, <clears throat> what many would call a rising uh, for lack of a better term, a rising star in the convention of, for Texas Baptists, right? He, he was uh, preaching and, and he was teaching there on his campus and all the professors, uh, they looked at him as, as one of the premier <clears throat> up-and-coming young Bible teachers in, in the university. And, and, and then, all of a sudden, one day, he ran into a man, a new student, there at the school by the name of Matt Chandler. And Matt Chandler, you may be familiar, is he's pastor at the, now he's the pastor at the Village Church uh, in Texas. It used to be First Baptist Church of, of uh, Highland Village, Texas. And they've, they've done, there's been a remarkable move of the Lord there. That church, they went from 150 to like 1,500, uh, felt like overnight, right? And, and so just that church that was kind of on its last leg has just been revived. And it's, it's been a cool thing to watch. But this is a story of these two men, Steve Besner and Matt Chandler, in college together at this Christian college, Hardin-Simmons University. They ran into each other. They, Steve said he immediately fell in love with Matt Chandler. He was, he was one of his best friends. The next year, they actually moved in together. They became roommates. <clears throat> and, and, and they would spend time talking and, and studying theology and studying the Bible. And everything was serene and great. Until, until the pastor at the, the church that was affiliated with the school, the pastor, uh, Steve Harden was his name, he, he had been teaching this prominent Bible study for the students and the faculty and everybody. And he had decided he was going to give up that Bible study due to just <clears throat> life circumstances. He was going to give it and hand the reins of that Bible study over to somebody else. Steve Besner thought... This is my chance. This is an amazing opportunity to get to preach the Bible to, to this group of people. And he hoped and he prayed and he begged that the Lord would give him uh, the reins of that Bible study. And he was shocked to find out that he did not get the role. But in fact, his roommate, Matt Chandler, received uh, the opportunity. And, and Matt Chandler started teaching this Bible study every week, and quite literally, it swelled. In Abilene, Texas, they were running 2,000 people at this weekly Bible study that Matt Chandler was, was teaching. And, uh, and, and he started getting all of these preaching opportunities all over Texas. People were calling for every event, every major opportunity that came up. Matt Chandler was, was the one that was going and, and doing the preaching. And, and, and even to add insult to injury, his roommate, Steve Besner, started becoming known as Matt Chandler's roommate. <clears throat> and, and so he, he said that was when the envy started to grow. And suddenly his roommate that, that he was so fond of, he, he had this division because he was jealous of the way that God was using his roommate, Matt Chandler. And, and uh, so, so it, was, it was just this one thing after another. And then they go and they become uh, pastors in individual churches. Matt Chandler at a very young age gets called the Highland Village Baptist Church. And like I said, uh, First Baptist Church. And, and like I said, it grew. It swelled to 1,500, 2,000 people. Seems like in just a year or something. I mean, and, and, and people are, are watching this go on. And every time he turns around, there's another story about Matt Chandler. And then, just to, to top everything off, Matt Chandler announces that he had been diagnosed with brain cancer. And now, for you and I in the room, and nearly everybody on the planet, that was devastating news. And so now here's Matt Chandler standing and proclaiming Sunday after Sunday with a scar in his head and, and no hair on his head, the goodness and the faithfulness of God, and people are just flocking to Matt Chandler. But do you know Steve Besner's reaction? Suddenly he found him in, himself in this very particular, peculiar situation where he was jealous of the brain cancer patient. 
He's going, well, if, if only something like that happened to me, maybe, maybe I'd get the attention. And finally, just to, to give you the end of the story, you know, Paul Harvey's the rest of the story deal, right? It, it all, it, it, it worked out. They reconciled. He called Matt up one day and said, you know, I'm jealous of you. And Matt said, it's kind of weird because a lot of days, I'm jealous of you. You know, and so they, they had this, this sweet reconciliation. He repented of, of the sin and, and all this sort of thing. But let me ask you, you know, at the end of the day, is anybody in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, does anybody in this room ever feel like that with some people? You feel like the Steve Besner of the story. You feel like, you know, I had a plan, I had goals, I had vision, I had direction, and, and for some reason, every time I had these best laid plans, they fall apart. And then you look over at your friend, and you're going, everything, that guy's got the Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to gold, but everything I touch starts to rust. It's just like everything, every time you get a plan together, the whole thing just comes crumbling down around you. Well, hey, I don't know where you are in the room spiritually, emotionally, in your life stage today. You might look at your life and you might think, hey, I, I should have been somebody by now. I should have done X, Y, or Z. I should have been involved in this or that. I, I should have. I should have. And yet, your plans have failed. Listen to me. God has a word for you today. This text, inspired by God, which means it's relevant in the first century and in the 21st century, this text is going to teach us why sometimes our best laid plans fail. And why sometimes they fail horrendously. So you need to pay attention because this applies to every person in this room. Paul and Silas, who have just picked up a new uh, young up-and-coming missionary and pastor named Timothy, have set out on Paul's second missionary journey. And, and Paul, his original goal was just to go and check on some of the churches that he'd planted in the region of Galatia. He'd planted a, a number of churches, probably some would say five, ten years before, in the lower region of Galatia. And so he went back and he was checking on these churches. He's, he's ministering to them. That's actually where they're in Lystra is where he picked up Timothy. He, he identified Timothy as an up-and-coming disciple and pastor. And so he took Timothy on this missionary journey with him. And now that he has checked in with the churches, he has checked in on God's people, made sure they had what they need. They were equipping people and preaching God's word and preparing God's people and doing the things that they were called to do. Paul and his company decide they're going to go out and they're going to start some more churches. He's got this grand plan. He's going to go to the region of Asia. Now, uh, don't, don't misunderstand here. This is not like the Asian continent, okay? It's not east of these guys. As a matter of fact, it's west of them, okay? So, so this isn't, this isn't um, him going to the... the Places like China and, and Japan, this isn't that. This is a region in a Roman province called Asia. It's the one uh, in, in 1 Peter. Peter actually writes his letter to churches scattered throughout this region. Asia. Okay? This is, this is an eastward direction for these men. And they're wanting to go into Asia, preach the gospel, lead people to the Lord, raise them up, plant churches. They've got this grand plan of everything that they're going to do. But then the text says that they were forbidden, look at verse 6, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. What a strange situation. Circle that word forbidden. This is an unusual situation circumstance for Paul who has been commanded to go reach the world with the gospel to be forbidden not by the Roman government not by his peers not by the people on his company who are afraid they might get persecuted but by the Holy Spirit of the living God forbidden to preach the gospel there in Asia what a strange situation 
And then, hey, check this out. They move a little bit further north. They come into the region of Mycenae, and just north of there was another province called Bithynia. And they think, well, if we can't go to Asia, then, then we'll go on up to Bithynia, and we'll plant churches there. And then I want you to look at the text. It says down in, in, uh, in, in verse 7 that they came to Mycenae. They tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. I'm going to tell you something. Circle that word there, the, the title, Spirit of Jesus. It's the only time in the Bible that, that's, that that uh, title is used for the Holy Spirit. And I think the reason is because this is a reminder to those, uh, uh, those, those missionaries. And hey, it's a reminder to you and me that when God said, when Jesus said, he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that was a promise. When Jesus said, uh, that, that, hey, I'll be with you to the end of the age, that was a promise. And if you're a living, breathing saint in the room today, born again from above, and God has saved you and radically transformed your life, listen to me today, there's nowhere you can run, there's nowhere you can hide because the Spirit of Jesus is there. It's the Spirit of Jesus with these men. And He is actually pressing on them. You can't go to the west immediately. You can't go to the north, but you have to go. And the question is how? <laughs> how did they, how did he stop them? Was it an audible voice? Was there an external audible voice from on high? Was there some internal uh, speaking and voice from the Holy Spirit? I don't know. It could have been situation. It could have been circumstantial that, that we just can't go into that region. And, and here's the thing, I like, that, uh, I like that interpretation, because did you know, look right here, this is fun fact about the Apostle Paul, did you know the Apostle Paul was very likely blind? In Galatians, in Galatians, he tells the Galatian believers, you would have ripped out your eyes and given them to me. Why would he need their eyes? Because he's blind. The guy was blind. Well, if that was the case, and if Paul had some illness, like a lot of people think that he did, some illness that affected his eyesight and rendered him blind, then maybe it was the case, and this is, this is just an interpretation, this is not 100% true, but maybe it's the case that when they came to Asia, when they came to Bithynia, Paul, his illness had acted up in such a way that, that he couldn't go on. And what he had to do was to find some coastal air that would help with his health issues. And so he went to a city called Troas over on the coast of the sea. And by the way, that would also account for the fact that somewhere along this journey, Paul picked up a doctor, a medical doctor. He said, Brother Duncan, how do you know that? I want you to look here in this text over in verse 10. It says, when Paul had seen the, imme uh, the vision, immediately who sought to go to Macedonia? We. Suddenly, this, this text is no longer in the third person. It's now in the first person because Dr. Luke, the one who wrote this book, Acts, the, the, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, has just inserted himself into the story as to say, I'm a researcher, I'm a doctor, I do all those things. I didn't have to research this. I saw it firsthand. And so he inserts himself into the story. Paul picked up a doctor at some point. Why? Maybe because he was sick. And so there he is. He's sick. He can't go. He's got to go to a coastal city. So he goes to the major city of Troas, which was on the coast. And there they, they, go, excuse me, they go to sleep one night. And Paul, in the night, gets this vision from God. Realizing he wasn't able to go to Asia. He wasn't able to go to Bithynia. Paul has a vision from God. And the vision is a man standing in Macedonia. You say, if you're like me, you're going... Where's Macedonia, right? It's right across the sea. And he's saying, I need you to come over here, Paul. Come to me. Preach to us. Why? Because we, hey, need help. There's a man crying out in the vision, help us. And I love this. Look down at the text. It says that immediately they started making preparations to go to Macedonia. Why? Because they concluded, look in verse 10, that God had called them to preach 
the gospel to the Macedonians. Their failure, their epic failure to reach Asia, their epic failure to go into Bithynia, their epic failure to reach any more people in that region, when their plans came crashing down, that is when God called. What a beautiful picture. God called them in the midst of their failure. Does that give anybody hope today? Anybody feel like a failure at times? It ought to give you joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that in your failures, God can use you. When your plans come crashing down, God can use you. Do you know even the best plans have to be informed by the Holy Spirit of God? And that's what happens here. And so they set sail. They go to Troas, and when they get there, they they make a direct voyage to Samothrace, and they follow the next day to Neapolis. They're going inland into this new region of Macedonia. And they get there to this major, major Roman city known as Philippi. And when they come to Philippi, we get the idea that they went around town. They probably spoke with some of the Jews, some of the leaders there in in the area. There were no Christians in this region at the time. The gospel hadn't made it that far yet that we know of. And so he's going around there talking with the Jews and as they always do when the Sabbath came around, they went and found the local synagogue, the local gathering of the Jews. And it just so happened that whether this was an actual building or this was a house outside the city or maybe they were just gathered together out at the river just outside the city gates, we don't know. But they went out and they found a group of Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, people. And they began to preach the gospel to them. And, and for some reason or another, they were divided up into groups. Uh, they, they, by male and female, they were segregated, if you will. And are you guys awake? <laughs> that was funny. All right. <laughs> and so they find these group of people. And they sit down with the women. And they begin to preach the gospel to these women. And the text says, this is an interesting thing. The text says that there was a woman there named Lydia. Many of you, you're shaking your head because you know the story of Lydia. It's a beautiful story. Let me give you some details. You may not know who Lydia is. The text tells us who Lydia is in more detail than, than we can read without the context. It says that Lydia was from the city of Thyatira. Now, that's interesting because if you heard when I read just a minute ago, this woman's about to get saved. And when she gets saved, she's going to invite Paul and his missionary uh, company to stay at her house in Philippi. She's from Thyatira, but she has a house in Philippi. This lady has a townhouse in New York and a penthouse in L.A. She is very, very wealthy. Very wealthy. Why is she wealthy? Well, it says that she not only was from Thyatira, had two houses, she's also a seller of purple goods. You say, that's great. Elk City colors are brown. I I don't understand what's, what's significant about purple, right? Merit, orange and black. What's the deal with purple? Did you know in the first century, and really throughout most of history, purple is identified as a color of royalty. Purple dye was the most expensive sort of dye for clothing. And, and so not just anybody could have purple on. Tori, see you in your purple shirt. Not just anybody could have purple. It took somebody of a, a wealthy class of people to have purple. And by the way, not only that, but if, if it was expensive to own purple, then how expensive was it to be a seller of it? You had to have stockpiles of purple in, in your possession at any given moment. It was an, an, an important thing because she was very wealthy. And then also the text tells us she was a worshiper of God. Now, that doesn't mean she was saved. It means that she came to synagogue. She was a pagan. She, didn't, she, she, she wasn't a Jew, per se, but she was friendly to the Jews. She came to synagogue. She listened to the law being read. She studied the law with people. She, she, she listened and, and cared about Yahweh and cared about him, but she hadn't become a full-fledged Jew. And then at the end of verse 14, this amazing thing happens. It says, the Lord 
opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention. Did you know, look right here at me, that is how we are saved. You may look at your life and you say, well, I'll be saved how and when I want to be saved. No, you won't. The Bible says the Lord opened her heart. And so when you hear the gospel and the gospel is proclaimed by spirit-filled believers, either from a pulpit or at the workplace or in the checkout counter, at the checkout counter at the grocery store or in the classroom or wherever it is, when the gospel is proclaimed, the Lord is opening hearts so that they can respond. And listen to me today when I tell you that you have to respond. If the gospel is preached over you and it it goes over your head or even hits you in the head and you like the intellect of history and, and you like all these things associated with the gospel but you haven't been hit in the heart by the gospel, you're lost. And you need Jesus. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said. And then it says, after she was saved, that she was baptized. It says she was baptized. She immediately followed the Lord in obedience. Because the first thing that he commanded us to do is to be baptized. That's why when you take the Lord's Supper, you say, oh, Brother Duncan, that's exclusive. We don't want to exclude anybody. I would much rather, listen to me, I would much rather people feel excluded today at First Baptist Church of Elk City than to stand before a living and holy God and to be excluded on that day. Follow him in obedience. And if you haven't followed him in obedience, listen to me, you are by default in disobedience. To be baptized after salvation as a a show of your faith to the Lord and to others, to his church. To be immersed in the water as a picture of what he did with you when the old things passed away and the new have come. So here they are. Lydia saved. They go back to her household. Her household gets saved. And they all get baptized too. Because they believe on the Lord Jesus. And then God has now taken their failure in Asia. And failure in Bithynia. And he's flipped it on its head by leading someone and people. A whole church of people to Christ. There in Macedonia in the city of Philippi. And not only that. He provides for them not just with fruit of salvation. He provides with them with a place to stay. Lydia even says. If you found me faithful to the Lord. Come on in. Come stay here while you're here. You need ministry headquarters. I've got a whole house. You can use all the rooms. You can come in and you can stay there. And by the way. Don't be one of these people that tries to make this into something relational that it's not. This was purely ministry based. She's housing them as, as a hostess. Uh, housing her guests. So they take up residence while they're there. So we see this beautiful picture that God has taken their failure and he's turned it into salvation, sweet salvation there in Macedonia. Hey, when we study through a book of the Bible, listen, this is a good Bible study um, principle here. When we study through a book of the Bible, it's important that sometimes we pull out of the narrative that we're looking at and we do a couple of things. We look backward And then we also look forward to see the context, the greater context of what's going on in history. Think about this for a moment. What has just happened? Well, we're seeing more fulfillment if you pull out and you pan backward to Acts chapter 1, where we started a decade ago. I don't know. Back back in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus said, hey, you will be my witnesses in Judea and all Samaria, Judah, uh, and, and, and excuse me, Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And where? To the end of the earth. They've now crossed over the sea. And they're reaching in a new territory that is untapped by the gospel. Unsaved, lost regions of the world. They're beginning this very uphill journey to the end of the earth. Let me tell you something else. If you look forward, if you pan uh, away from the past and into the future just a few years, into the New Testament, you know what you run into? You run into the book, a letter written by Paul, titled in your Bible, Philippians. Did you know? That when God inspired Philippians, he inspired a letter to Lydia. 
and to some others that we're going to meet in the next week or a couple weeks. Beautiful picture that God is now establishing a church. Hey, you want me to make it more personal for you? Look right here a minute. Let's pan even further into the future. And let's look geographically. Let's look historically at what's going on here. This is one of my, look right here. Don't miss this. It's one of my favorite things in the whole Bible. All right? One of my favorite, favorite pictures. Because it directly involves you. You say, oh, Brother Duncan, I ain't been around that long. How, how could it involve me? Wait a minute. Just hang with me. So this is the first convert, the first Christian, the first disciple in Macedonia and in Philippi. Do you know where Philippi is, where Macedonia is? It's on the European continent. This is the first Christian in all of Europe. Say, great, what's the significance? Well, over the next 1,400 years or so, the church of Jesus Christ would gradually become headquartered in Europe. Do you know prior to 1500, early, early 1500s, there weren't all these denominations. There was really just one, with a couple of exceptions, one major branch of Christianity, and it was the Catholic Church. And it was headquartered in Rome. It was headquartered in Europe. It was headquartered in this area. And it gradually rooted itself in, and it took over the entire European continent until, right, until around 1500s, when the Catholic king of England, Henry VIII, just couldn't stand his wife anymore, Catherine of Aragon, and wanted a divorce. And he went to the Pope, and he said, hey, I need a divorce. And you know what the Pope said? (laughs) He said, you're not getting one. And so they ran into conflict. You know what the Church of England did? They became the Church of England. (laughs) He, He essentially said, well, I'm divorcing her. They got excommunicated, they got kicked out, and then the king or the the monarch of England became the head of the English church. And you know what they did when they established their church? They basically recreated the Catholic church. They did everything the Catholics did. It looked and mirrored very much like Catholicism. And then about, I don't know, 80 years after that or so, this group of people, they decided, we want to be much different than the Catholic church. We now have the Bible in our hands. We don't want to look like the Catholics. We don't want to act like the Catholics. We want to act like this church that we find in Acts. They didn't have seven sacraments in Acts. They had two things that they were supposed to do. Two pictures. They had baptism and they had the Lord's Supper. We want to do those things and nothing else. We want to to preach the gospel. We want to make disciples. We want to do what God's word tells us to do. And so this group of people, they got together And they decided, we're going to leave. We're going to be persecuted here in the Church of England. Let's leave. So they moved to Holland. Yeah, They moved to Holland. They're there for a few decades. And you know what they started to notice? These believers who were wanting to hold to the Bible as closely as they could, they got to noticing, hey, here in Holland, our kids are being Hollandized, if you will. Is that a word? It is now. (laughs) They're, be, they're, they're, they're losing their English identity, our English practices. So they decided we need to do something different. We can't go back to England. It's a total failure there. They're going to persecute us. We don't want to be here because we're losing our heritage. So what are we going to do? So they made a couple more stops, and then they set sail for a new world. And they landed just off the coast of a place that we call Cape Cod, on November 11th, 1620. And just a few weeks after that, went to Plymouth Rock. And they were the pilgrims that we learn about in, in school, right? They were the pilgrims. And why is that significant to you? Because when the gospel came to North America, it spread, much like in Europe, coast to coast, sea to shining sea. It made it all the way across. It swept across the Appalachians. It swept across the, mid, uh, the Midwest. It swept across all the way, believe it or not, to California. And guess who's right there in the middle of that? A church out in western Oklahoma called First Baptist Church of Elk City that's meeting and worshiping the Lord Jesus here today, all because Paul, the apostle, and his group failed in Asia, failed in Bithynia, sought the Lord, were given direction by the Lord, and led Lydia to Christ. 
Somebody, that's a good amen spot. God takes our colossal failures and he uses them and we have these big plans for our lives and all these things that we want to do and that we think he ought to do. Can I tell you something? Look right here at me. God fulfills his plans sometimes by frustrating yours. Sometimes God just has to fulfill his plans by frustrating yours, even when they have really good intentions. So I want to show you just a few observations here that I have from this text very quickly. And then we're going to have the Lord's Supper. God's, I want to show you God's motives for frustrating good plans. Right? Why would a good God frustrate good plans? Well, there are a few reasons. First thing that I think we see, principle that we see played out in this text, is that God's plan is greater than even your best intentions. You might have really good intentions. And God has something completely different in store. Isn't that amazing? That, that I can dream up this big plan and it won't even compare to the plan that God has in store. His plan is greater than even our best intentions. You know, in 1912, there was a man named John Harper who was a Scottish evangelist. He was coming over to the United States. He was going to preach for three months over in the Moody Church. Um, it was Erwin Lutzer, you might remember him. Uh, D.L. Moody, this was the church that he started or that started right after his ministry. Um, he was going to come and preach for three months at the Moody Church, and he had all these, these plans. The Moody Church had plans. They were going to see people come to know the Lord. They were going to see saints equipped in their faith, and, and all this stuff through the preaching ministry of John Harper. Well, he got on a boat that day, and he began to make his way over in April of 1912. And, and if you looked up on the side of the, the ship, you would have noticed that it said, RMS Titanic. And John Harper... John Harper, when they hit that iceberg and it began to sink, he began going around, story says, and telling everyone he could about the gospel, knowing that death was imminent. He sank. He got his, his family on a ship, on a boat, a lifeboat, and they left. He sank into those icy waters carrying a life jacket. And the story goes that there was a man there in the water without a life jacket. And he looked at the man and said, do you know Jesus? And the man said, no, I do not. And John Harper threw his life preserver to the man and said, you need that more than I do. And he sank to his death. Well, that man, understandably, got saved. <laughs> That night or in the days following. And he got saved spiritually. He also got saved physically. They took him out of the water. That life jacket kept him alive. And he went on and he wrote a gospel tract that led who knows how many people to the Lord. Called I Was, uh, I was John, uh, what's his last name? <laughs> John Harper's Final Convert. Isn't that amazing? Our best laid plans used for God's glory just obliterated for God's glory. Why? Because his plans are greater than even our best intentions. Let me tell you something else. God's plan is clearer than you can see. God's plan is clearer than we can see. Do you know, uh, this last week I saw this coolest thing. Sometimes we do stuff and we're just doing it out of, out of habit, but, but we're serving the Lord, Right? So how many people in the room, Sunday school teachers, sometimes you slide into Sunday school and uh, you're not quite prepared, but, but you're there, you've done what you could, you know, don't answer that. Just me? No? Okay, all right. So sometimes that happens, right? And, and, but, but at the end of the day, you're, you're sliding in, you're doing what you're supposed to do, and then God will use those ministries radically in ways that we never could have imagined. You know, somewhere there was a t-shirt shop making uh, and designing uh, shirts for Falls Creek, one of the Baptist camps we got here in, in the state, right? And they were making these shirts for Falls Creek, and this is a cool thing. They were just doing what they do, right? Some designer out there somewhere. You got that picture up there? Uh, last week, a missionary posted on the Oklahoma Youth Ministry page. He's a missionary in Madagascar. Madagascar, 90 to 100% of the clothes that are there um, are are manufactured outside of the country and imported in their used clothing. Nobody there speaks English, okay? But there in the capital of Madagascar, this missionary, who used to be a, a missionary here in the state, of, or a, a youth pastor here in the state of Oklahoma, was driving along and he glanced over and he saw something familiar. And you can't quite see it very clearly in this photo, 
But that shirt that that man's wearing says, Saved at Falls Creek. In Madagascar. With an Oklahoma missionary who knows what Falls Creek is. <laughs> Happened to be driving down the road. I wonder the gospel conversation that flowed from that. God has a clearer purpose than we can see. You think your service to him is, is just something you do. You think whenever I, I tell somebody the gospel, oh, they'll probably never come to Jesus. When I teach a class, oh, they'll, they'll, never, they'll never grow in their faith. Listen to me today. It's not your job to grow them. It is the job of the Holy Spirit of the living God, and he is faithful, and he'll do it. He'll carry out his greater plans and his greater purpose for your life and for the lives of those around you. God's plan is greater than even our best intentions. God's plan is clearer than what we can see. God's plan extends further than our afflictions. Further than our afflictions. You know, I told you about the Moody Church just a moment ago. You might remember um, in 18, what, 1871. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you may remember 1871. Eh. Not going there. Okay, 1871, the great Chicago fire. That morning, D.L. Moody was preaching in his church. Thousands of people in there. And at the end of the service, he gave a, a lengthy explanation of hell and what might happen for those who die and go there. And at the end of the service, instead of calling people to Jesus, you know what he did? He said, I want you to think about it for a week, and I want you to come back and next week, commit your life to the Lord. Well, before the service ended, bells started ringing, which wasn't totally abnormal there in Chicago. Fire bells happened all the time. The great Chicago fire destroyed much of the city that night. Countless people's lives were lost. And the Moody Church itself was destroyed in 1871. D.L. Moody regretted so much never offering invitation to those people because how many of them died that night? He regretted so much not offering them the opportunity to know Jesus. He resolved he'd never do that again. Fast forward just a few years, 1878, J. Wilbur Chapman, who eventually would become another, um, an, another evangelist, came to Chicago. He heard the gospel preached. He was, he was invited to Jesus. He talked with Moody in person. Moody led him to the Lord. J. Wilbur Chapman became a successful evangelist. Along the years, he ran into a young man by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was an up-and-coming evangelist, wanted to learn some things. J. Wilbur Chapman took Billy Sunday aside, and he trained Billy Sunday for a couple of years in the ministry and how to be an evangelist. So Billy Sunday, Sunday goes off, and he starts preaching these great revivals. Well, there was, there was a group in Charlotte, North Carolina, who heard Billy Sunday's revivals, and they thought, man, the way that he does that, the way that he approaches that is amazing. We need to model that sort of ministry. And so they modeled that sort of ministry, and that ministry, stemming from Billy Sunday, Sunday's ministry led to the salvation of a man by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, because he was influenced by that ministry, wound up preaching a revival service there in Charlotte, North Carolina. And do you know who was saved at Mordecai Ham's revival service? A young man who was there to mock him up in the balcony by the name of Billy Graham. The affliction that plagued Chicago that night in 1871 has led to millions of salvations. You think God can't use your pain? You say, it hurts. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know how badly it hurt me that these pet plans were crushed and that I, I didn't get what I wanted and I needed it and I wanted it and I had it in my head. Listen to me today. God's plan extends much further than your affliction ever will much further than your pain ever will. And lastly, I want to share this with you. God's plan is louder than we can hear. When these men, there in, in Asia and Mycenae and, and Bithynia and then ultimately in Troas, they, they were looking for an opportunity to advance the gospel. They wanted to tell somebody and plan a church and they looked around, they, they didn't have any opportunity for one reason or another. God had closed the door. But then what God did, he did this amazing thing. He sent him a vision, a man crying out from Macedonia, help us. And you know what? When they showed up, did they find the man crying out? No, they found Lydia. And what I think that means 
is that the man in the vision was representative of all humanity there in Macedonia, saying, help us. And listen to me today, church. That is the cry of the lost world around us. Every lost person crying out, help us. Help us. When they set out for Asia and Bithynia, they didn't have the cry of the Macedonians in their minds. They never could have heard that until God showed them. This morning, I was in the shower, and I had all these plans. I was going to get out, I was going to get dressed, I got to go to the church, we got to do announcements, and we got to do the reminder, and we got to go to church, and we got a business meeting, now I got a mission meeting at 4.30, we got this, that, and the other. I had all these plans in my head, and all of a sudden, my oldest son comes running in, and he says, Dad, I need help! It's like, what? You know? What is it? He has got this lightsaber hilt that's made out of conduit, just metal, right? And it's all taped up, and it looks like a lightsaber hilt. He'd gotten his finger stuck inside it. <laughs> you laugh. That is the scariest set of Chinese finger cuffs I have ever seen. All right? I'm thinking, I'm looking at that, and I'm going, well, it's going to be all right, I hope. <laughs> I mean, dude, I'm thinking, this is not good, <laughs> you know? And, and by the way, I'm also thinking, I had plans for today. I wanted to preach about God interrupting our plans. And here he was interrupting my plans. I said, and then this was just the blessing of God. I said, run cold water over that thing for five minutes. Slipped right off. Ha! Dad of the year, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Listen. I had no idea that I would be hearing that this morning. <laughs> never in a million years. Could have guessed a thousand times, twelve hundred times. Never would have guessed that. Maybe thirteen hundred. I've thought about it before. But I had no idea. And you know what? We got a whole lost world around us and we have all these plans and we're going places and we're doing things and we have this on the agenda and this on the schedule for today and we have all this stuff that needs to get done and then at the end of the day, there are people crying out around us, help us, help us. You say, well, they're not crying out uh, physically. I haven't heard them. No, they're crying out with their sin. They're crying out in their addictions. They're crying out in their abuse. They're crying out in their hurt and in their pain and they're saying, I can't break loose of this thing and sin's got a hold on me. Hey, listen to me. That's how this lost and undone, backward, hell-bound, hopeless world is crying out. They're crying out in the way that they live and when we come along and we have this gospel that sets men free and brings dead men to life, hey, we have an obligation to share that truth. Maybe today you need a new resolve to put your faith in Jesus with that person at the workplace and say, Lord, I don't know what will happen. I'm going to risk the relationship and I'm going to go to them I'm going to tell them the gospel. I'm going to go to that person in my family. I'm going to say, Lord, Lord, use this moment and, and I'm going to tell that person the gospel of Jesus and, and hope that they'll come. Maybe, look right here at me, maybe you're in the room today and it's none of those things. But maybe, just Maybe, hang with me here. You're the one crying out for help. You're like that Macedonian man and you're yelling out, Help me. I need somebody to save me. I can't do this on my own. I can't overcome the addiction. I can't stop the hurt. I can't stop the, the, the abuse, whatever it is. I, I, can't, I can't change what I've done. And I've got shame. And I've got guilt. Listen to me today when I tell you that there is a God who loves you so greatly that he sent his only son Jesus to die on a bloody and a rugged cross for your sin. He paid the penalty. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. He did not deserve death and yet he willingly took it for you. Maybe today you need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. As soon as I start praying, I want to invite the, the deacons to go ahead and come forward and start preparing for the Lord's Supper service. And I want you to continue, church family, your time of reflection, asking God to evaluate you. And here, right here, if God's doing a work in your life, you may think, oh, that'd be awkward. Hey, it's a lot better to be awkward now than awkward on that day. 
you just stand up, and as the deacons are coming down to prepare the meal, I would love for you to come down here and put your hand in my hand and give your heart to Jesus and let him and, and, and call upon him as Lord that he might save you today. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you confess him as your Lord, hey, you will be saved. It's a promise. Not that you might be, not that you could be. It says you will. Put your faith in Jesus today. I'm going to pray as the deacons come forward while I pray. And if you're in that camp and you're crying out, help me, you come forward too. Let's pray. Father, in the strong name of Jesus, we thank you for this text. I thank you that, Holy Spirit, you are not some God that sits high on a cloud, spins up the, your creation and, and just turns us loose, but that you care about the intimate details of our lives. And I know you care about the lives of every person in this room. And I pray now that you'd convict us, that you'd draw us uh, closer to you, that you would convict us of sin and of righteousness for the lost in the room or the lost online. I pray that they would right now repent of their sin, that they would put their faith in Jesus, that they would call upon you as Lord. They may be saved. We're going to thank you for it in his name. Amen.